Welcome to the Leverington Church Message Series, Beyond Order and Chaos, a biblical encounter with Jordan Peterson's latest book. For the full series and additional resources, go to www.leverington.org. Have you ever had this experience? You're sitting in a room, and you're looking around, and it suddenly occurs to you, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be depressed in the world. There's a lot of reasons to feel out of sort. But as I sit here, noticing what I'm feeling, I'm not feeling this because of things that are being done to me. I'm not feeling this because of problems out in the world. I'm not even feeling this way because of thoughts in my head. I'm feeling this way because I am surrounded by chaos. Now, maybe your room doesn't look quite that bad, but is there a mess? Could it be that that chaos and mess is actually affecting your sense of peace and well-being? It does for me, and it does for Ruth. Uh, As a matter of fact, I think for most of us, at some point, chaos really does this to us psychically. Now, in most couples, uh, one of them is neater than the other. So Ruth is extremely neat, and I am the well-adjusted, balanced one. (laughs) Uh, Anyone here the more messy one in your family? Can I see some? Oh, see some surprise? (laughs) These are surprises to me. That's great. Well, you guys are my peeps, right? So I'm, I'm thankful for that. But I think even for us, at some point... It's really disturbing and depressing, and it wears at us. It's kind of this background radiation. So let me ask you this. You know, I go into a lot of people's homes. Um, When I walk into a home and it's really, really messy and all over the place, here's the question. Is that physical chaos a reflection of the chaos in the person's mind? or the chaos in the family system, or is it because the room is so chaotic that it makes our thinking chaotic? Like, which way does it work? I think it works both ways. I think it is a two-way street. So either way, it matters. And so in Jordan Peterson's original book, 12 Rules for Life, he started with a rule. Do you want to start fixing your life? Start by cleaning your room, which is hysterical, but then you think about it. If you can't even clean up your room, who are you to give advice to the world? Get your own life in order before you start pontificating to other people about how they should live theirs. So now here's the question, though. Then what is the answer to this depressing chaos? Like if we know chaos like makes us depressed, What is the solution, the exact opposite, complete order? Well, let me show you a neat, tidy room in perfect order. A prison cell or a military barracks. A place for everything and everything in its place. And yet, that's depressing. That is life-killing. So think about it, isn't that weird? Too much chaos, depressing. Too much order, depressing. You see, we need something beyond order. We need something more than order in the space that we call our home. So in the tension between utter chaos and utter order lies hiding, lurking what we need. Meaning, beauty, art. And so the rule for today from Peterson's second book, Beyond Order, is this. Try to make one room in your home as beautiful as possible. So you think about it. His first book was aimed at people who were out of control of their lives. They they weren't taking responsibility for their lives. It was just chaos. So he tried to help them get to the point of order. So if you clean your room, that's really a great start. And then you sit in a really clean room for a while, and you're like, yeah, but I need more. Yes, you do. You need meaning. You need beauty. And so that's why this second book is beyond order. 
I need beauty and meaning in my life. So today we are going to talk about bringing beauty and art into our homes, but this is a more profound issue than that sounds. Peterson says, we need to understand the role of art and stop thinking of it as an option or a luxury or at worst an affectation. No, art is the bedrock of culture. That's his claim. That's a big claim. So before we get into bringing beauty and art into our homes, before we get to how scripture can guide that process, let's consider the actual lives of the people who make art, the artists. A number of people in this room are artists, and I am very glad to know you. My life is improved because of you. You guys, what what the musicians just did with that song is a blessing I'm taking with me for the rest of the week. That was just magnificent. Uh, And so, of course, music is one of the great arts. Now, let me ask a question. Since I was in a band most of my life, would you give me permission to give one musician joke? Yes? Okay, here we go. What's the difference between a drummer and a pizza? A pizza can feed a family of four. (laughs) The truth is, if you are going to be a professional musician, it is extremely difficult, extremely hard, and many musicians and artists are poor in their lifetime. And here's the key. Even if they are doing a fantastic job. Well, why is that? Well, there's a number of reasons. We could say, well, one is, you know, society doesn't appreciate the arts the way it should. Yes. Here's another one. Real art comes from exposing yourself to the dangerous boundary where order and chaos collide. Sometimes, standing on the edge of chaos, standing on the edge of ultimate possibility, infinite possibility, is too much for a sensitive human spirit. And a sensitive human spirit is exactly what you need to create good art. And sometimes artists descend into that chaos. And so because of that, they poorly manage their lives, including their finances. And so sometimes their obsession with their passion means that they're not worldly wise. That's the reason, but I'll give you a deeper reason. And the most important, I believe. True artistic geniuses. What are they doing? They are creating new ways of seeing the world. New ways of seeing that seem strange and alarming to conventional people who are used to traditional ways of looking at things. And then, because of that, there's this long lag between radical new art and its social acceptance. And because of that, there's a radical lag between radical new art and financial commercial success. So here's an example. Van Gogh, in a span of eight years, created 800 paintings and sold only one. He was forever in debt, forever borrowing money, near bankruptcy when he died in 1890, The people of his time did not value his work. They thought it was childish. Today, each of his paintings is worth well over a million dollars. Starry Night alone, anybody want to guess what its estimated worth is? One hundred million dollars. Now, here's the thing. That's the exact same painting it was in 1890 when no one would buy his art. It's the exact literal physical thing. But society finally caught up and has come to appreciate the genius and the profound beauty to see that there's far more going on in it than a quick glance would give you. This doesn't mean that every artist is a genius, right? Just like every area of work, there are people who are really at the top and there's a lot of us who are average. Like I am like a pathetic artist. I'm a pathetic 
<laughs> like I'm a poet, I'm a musician, I'm a painter, I'm a photographer, but I'm just like not very good at any of them. And um, I think Ruth is really glad that I'm keeping my day job, right? So some artists, right, are going to be geniuses and some are going to be average, but all of them, if they're going to be really pursuing art, are living on the edge of chaos and order. And so when they're living there, they're striving to turn chaos around them into some kind of new order that has never existed before, trying to make meaning out of it, and that is a risky proposition. So since they are often poor, if they're pursuing this full-time, they have to seek out parts of town where they can afford to live, which is where? Usually the really bad parts of town, right? But parts that they see potential in. And then what do they do? They make art. Same dreary road, same dreary buildings all around, but suddenly because of this, this burst of color, burst of hope, nothing but a few cans of paint, and yet suddenly the psychic reality on this block has changed. Would you feel better and would you somehow weirdly feel safer in a depressed part of Philadelphia if this was added? I would. It would feel like there's a piece of civilization there. Okay, well then what happens once there's this foothold of beauty? Well, then more artists move in and then there becomes, begins to be a sense of community and then more works and then funky little art galleries and then the next thing you know, the hipster coffee shop goes in and then things start to get better and they start to get more beautiful and they actually get safer. I mean, think about it. Would you rather have gang members or artists living next door as your neighbors? And then those who appreciate the ethos of the artistic life, they begin to move in as they notice, like, this is really cool. And then it becomes chic. And then the price of apartments starts to go up as it becomes more and more popular, right? Gentrification. And now the original artists can no longer afford to live in the haven they created. And so they move to another dingy part of town and begin creating beauty and hope again. I tell you all that because some of us are tempted to think of art as unimportant, like window dressing. Ah, yeah, okay, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Something nice to add later if we have time, if we get around to it. After all, what is the economic value of art? Well, I just told you. It's priceless, what it can do. Listen to what Peterson basically says in his book, Beyond Order. Artists live at the edge of chaos and order, transforming chaos into order. They are the initial civilizing agents. A true artist is contending with something they do not fully understand, striving to bring something new into focus. They feel their way forward, not knowing exactly what the final product will be. Many of you have artists, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have an idea, and then by the time it, you don't really actually know what it's going to be at the end. And then you are, and you're like, wow, I didn't even see that coming. They are guided by feel, by intuition, striving to bring something new into clear focus. Here's the key. And those of you who are artists, you guys can... Confront me if you don't buy this, because I, I buy what he's about to say. They must be contending with something they do not fully understand, or they are not artists. They are mere propagandists, reversing the artistic process. A propagandist already knows exactly what the end product is going to be and exactly what the total message you are supposed to get from it. So they take ideology and they dress it up in art clothes. The art then serves as window dressing, like a gimmick for the message. They use the deep emotional power of art. They take its methods to gussy up 
a message that could be reduced to nothing more than sentences. If your art can be reduced to nothing more than sentences and propositions, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about great art. That is not access to the transcendent. That is not exploring the beyond. That is persuasive sweet speech in dress-up clothes. Art that stands the test of time transcends the artist. It says more than the artist intended or understood themselves. You can't neatly put it into words because it's more than words. It moves us deeply, and we don't fully know exactly why, and that's the power of it. Okay, okay, great. But why do we need art? Because it helps us see again. It puts us in touch with the transcendent. It lifts us out of the mundane and to the realm of the good and the true and the beautiful, and therefore it can be a source of hope. We need this now perhaps more than any other time in history. Well, why do you say that? Because we are so focused these days on efficiency and expediency and moving quickly. Peterson talks about his own experience. He's a, he's a young uh, professional and he's trying to get ahead and he's walking down a sidewalk and he's passing all these houses and what does he really see think about what it takes to actually study a house to notice the way the sunlight hits the ancient brick wall in such a beautiful way to notice the playful dance of the shadows of the tree overhead on the porch below to to notice that the stoop is curved out and imagine how many feet walking in generations it took to do that, to notice the strange dignity of the rusty old door handle. That takes a lot of time and attention. And that's just one house of the hundred houses he has to pass to get to where he's going. And so what do you do? Because your brain can't process all that, so it reduces those things to two-dimensional icons. It's just, okay, it looks at an object. This is what we do. I think this is what we do. We don't notice we're doing it. Okay, there's an object over there. It's called a house. Is it hurling at me? No. Is it dangerous? I don't think so. Is it the place I'm trying to get to? No. Well, then don't really see it. Just imagine a low-resolution image of, of a house and pay no attention to it. Don't see the world Don't notice the meaning all around you. Stay on task. Again, Peterson talks about being this young father early in his career, trying to get ahead, and how efficient he tried to be with his time. And he writes, I knew perfectly well that I was missing out on beauty and meaning and engagement, regardless of whatever advantages in efficiency my impatience wrought. I was narrow, sharp, and focused, and did not waste time. But the price I paid for that was the blindness demanded by efficiency, accomplishment, and order. I was no longer seeing the world. I was seeing only the little I needed to navigate it with maximum speed at the lowest cost. Beauty leads us back to what we have lost, childlike wonder. But there's a practical reason to pursue art as well. Remember what I said, art is the bedrock of culture itself. It represents the collected wisdom of our civilization. And we need that because people have been working at how to live and what it means to be a human being for a pretty long time. And what they've produced may at times look strange to you but it's also rich beyond comparison. Why not use it as a guide? A real piece of art is a window into the transcendent, and you need that in your life because you are finite and limited and bounded by your ignorance. (laughs) And so am I. As you meditate on redeeming art and beauty, your your vision will be grander 
and your plans more comprehensive. You will consider other people more intelligently and completely. You will take care of yourself more effectively. You will understand the present more profoundly, rooted as it is in the past, and you will come to conclusions much more carefully. That's what he says, and I actually buy a whole lot of what he just said. Okay, so if all that's true, if it's all true, why wouldn't we pursue that? Peterson says, because all this is very frightening. It's frightening to perceive the empty shells of ourselves that we have become. It is frightening to glimpse, even for a moment, the transcendent reality that exists beyond. We think we border our great paintings with luxurious and elaborate frames to glorify them, but we do it at least as much to insist to ourselves that the glory of the painting itself ends at the frame. That bounding, that bordering, leaves the world we're familiar with comfortably intact and unchanged. We do not want that beauty reaching out past the limitations imposed on it and disturbing everything that's familiar. I mean, imagine a painting just like pouring out, disrupting everything that we take for granted. And that is exactly why we need it. We need the transcendent meaning that is in the universe And there is that meaning in the universe because it was created by a transcendent God and he brought beauty into this universe to break into our ordinary lives that we might not allow our existence to devolve into the shackles of materialism. Good art moves us and we don't know quite why. Good art includes question marks that encourage us to ponder and encourage us to work for a better future. Good art can lead us to profound gratitude for the gift of life, for the gift of our very incarnation. Okay, but all this talk about the importance of art, is this really Christian? Is this really Christian? Well, what do the scriptures teach us? If I open this Bible to the very first book, which is really, really important, right? It's like, basically, here's the big story. Here's what's really important. What's the very beginning? In the beginning, God created. And if you take one look around this world, you know that God is an artist. God created. Then he created us in his image. What does that mean? He created us. What is his prime, the prime function of his image? Creativity. He created us to create He created us to create art. He is the master artist. Second, God commands us to create art and connect it directly to true worship. Think about how ancient Israel worshiped during the Exodus. The tabernacle, also known as the tent of the congregation, was this portable, like, earthly church, right? It was like a sanctuary, but it was just a tent. I want you to think about this. They're using this to worship God while they're on the run. They're still nomads. They're out in the middle of nowhere. They're in the desert with no settled home when they had all kinds of pressing issues on their mind, like, hey, how about survival? And yet in the midst of all that, beautiful art done unto God was seen as extremely important. Listen to Exodus chapter 35, verses 31 to 35. It's talking about God. And he, the Lord, has filled, an artisan, with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all craftsmanship to make designs for working in gold and in silver and in bronze, verse 33, and in cutting of stones for settings, not for a bridge, for a mosaic, the cutting of stones for settings, and in the carving of wood, sculpture, so as to perform, listen to that word, every inventive work. What does inventive mean? Brand new, never existed before, bringing order out of chaos, making new order. Verse 35, he has filled them with skill 
to perform every work of an engraver and of a designer and of an embroiderer in blue, in purple, in scarlet, in scarlet material and in fine linen and of a weaver as performers of every work and makers of designs. Do you catch that? Color matters. Color matters to God. Fabrics matter. Sculpture matters. Beauty matters. For what? For those people's corporate worship of God. They're orthodox, theologically, straight out worship of God. So not only do we realize the importance of art and the role of artists in worship, each of us personally is called by the scriptures to pursue the good and the true and the beautiful. Listen to Philippians 4.8. I know for some of you here, this is your favorite verse. It is one of my very favorite verses in the Bible. So when you see the world around you is insane, when you see the world around you is full of hateful voices and nasty liars, and when you don't know what to do, listen to Paul. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely or beautiful, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Man, if there was ever a verse to hang on your refrigerator or your bathroom mirror, like when you're lost in your head, isn't that the verse I need to turn to? So beauty matters to God. It was part of the original creation, and he created us to be moved by it. I mean, all that beauty in the temple was for the people to see. And so when we meditate on this, when we meditate on what is lovely and beautiful and noble, what happens? It actually changes us. And notice, well, I'm just going to tell you, that verb think on these things, is in what we call the imperative mode. That means it's a command. It's not a suggestion. This verse is not saying, oh, wouldn't it be nice to think about these things? This is a command for living the Christian life of discipleship. Part of Christian discipleship is pursuing this kind of life of the mind, and surely that includes art. Now, I know if I came up to a lot of you and said, hey, tell me about your art, I think a lot of us would say, I'm not a very great artist. A lot of us are like really intimidated by that. But all of us can appreciate art. And we can make spaces clean and tidy and welcoming and beautiful. And even as many of you know, just changing the color of the paint in a room can do wonders. We can choose to bring more beauty into our lives. And so here's the primary thing I want you to take away. It is not selfish of you to want a beautiful space to live in. That's not being selfish. And that's not being inefficient. And you don't have to spend a ton of money. This isn't about having impressive possessions, like, oh, that's an original blah, blah, blah. No, it's not about that. It's about creating a space of beauty and welcome and peace as a way of honoring this precious gift of life, honoring how precious this incarnation that we get to live in a world of light and shadow and sculpture and stone, that that's a gift. And our, our houses should reflect that. Our homes should reflect that. Don't say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get around to that later when I have time because I have really more important things to do because that's not really that important. How about if this is one of the most important things we can do for our own emotional and spiritual health? Like it's more important than we realize. Wouldn't investing in beauty and art in your daily life be a wise move? Now, we can't make the whole world beautiful, right? And there's so many things that are out of our control, but we could make a tiny little corner of it beautiful. So how do we start? We start by cleaning up one room, and then we try and make that one room in our home as beautiful as possible. 
So Ben, you got that? Okay. <laughs> Wait, if my son John is watching this, do you get that? <laughs> Start by cleaning up your room and then try and make it as beautiful as you can. You may find that by creating this little small oasis in the midst of chaos and the insanity of our world gives you the encouragement to spread that order and that beauty a little further, maybe to the next room, maybe to the next room, redeeming physical space. And I know many of you would say something like this, Oh, I'm not an expert. I don't know anything about art. I just know what I like. I I just know what moves me. That's the whole point. That's the most important part. Don't put any stuff in your house because people tell you it's good art. Don't put stuff in your house just because someone famous made it. Put it in your house because it moves you in good ways, even though you might not exactly know why. That is the transcendent part. I have a painting. Mom, if you're watching, this is like the Palmer family hour here. Mom, if you're watching, I want to thank you once again for the piece of art you gave me that's over our fireplace. I've been looking at that for 40 years and I'm still not done with it. It still surprises me. So thank you. That's what good art can do. I have no idea who painted this thing. I I have no, like, it's just this thing that moves me in this beautiful, it's, it's, it's God that's actually used this thing in my life for good. L- art like that that has question marks in it that you're like, I, I don't really quite get it. I, I don't know why, but I like, there's something about it. That's the kind of art that ages well, right? That's like a fine wine. That will travel through life with you. And of course, as real and as important as all this is, and I've taken this time because I don't think we talk about art enough in the church, All of what I've just talked about, it's all actually meant to be a signpost to you pointing, pointing you to open yourself up to what is most real, pointing you not only to the redemption of physical space by human effort, but to the redemption of your very soul by the power of God. Physical beauty was always intended by God, not to be a dead end in itself, not to be pointing to itself, but rather to be a signpost to the ultimate artist. And when it's not, when it's just about itself, it can become a very dangerous idol. Like if I'm just pursuing art for art's sake, in my mind, that can be a very dangerous idol. Rather, it was meant to remind us that there's so much more to life than stuff and money and obligations and responsibility. That the source of all that is good and true and beautiful is the author. That the source of all that is good and true and beautiful is the one who was and is and shall be, the maker of heaven and earth, the author of truth, the author of justice, the author of life, the author of beauty itself. And when we take Jesus' hand, the one who stands in the gap between the ultimate artist, the creator, and us creatures when we're willing to do that, then the good and the true and the beautiful of heaven itself can flow into us and out into the world around us, out into this world that so desperately needs the light and the color of the gospel. So here's the encouragement and here's the challenge of the message today. When you decide to live for the gospel, when you declare to yourself, okay, self Rather than being bitter and grasping and resentful, I'm going to serve and love others well out of my love for Jesus. When you decide to do that, do you know what you become? A piece of art. Your life becomes a piece of art in the middle of a gray, mean, depressing street. Your life was meant to be a piece of art. When you turn from your natural despair to the good news of Jesus, your life becomes a beacon of hope to others. Think about what we used to sing when we were little kids. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. When you do, you change the psychic landscape for the people around you. You change the spiritual environment 
for the people around you. This is why we need Jesus. This is why we need to return to the community of the church. Allow this gathering to be a haven. Allow it to be a haven where people come together. A gathering of the masterpieces of God. So, I've asked you to do this before. I'm going to ask you to do it one more time. But it'll be fun. It'll be worth it, I promise. Take a moment and just look around at the people around you. Creep them out. Look backwards. Look at the people behind you. Just take a moment and look at the people around you. And you might say, well, they're not much to look at. Well, neither are you. No, look at them again. Take that second glance. You are looking at starry, starry night. You are gathered in a room of people who are seeking God. Think about, I want you to think about this. You have the privilege of sitting in a room with a bunch of people who are seeking God. They have a desire to know the good and the true and the beautiful and the fellowship of the maker of heaven and earth. They desire to follow the true king of love and goodness and truth, Jesus the Christ. What could be more beautiful? The best way to ruin a light-giving, warmth-giving campfire is to take the logs and pull them apart and put them away out on their own. But when you bring them together, then the fire burns brightly. We have come together, what we're supposed to be about in this space, and hopefully in cafe in just a few minutes, is to share our gifts with each other. We can encourage each other towards acts of love and acts of service and acts of art in the name of Jesus, and that is where true hope is found. Let's pray. Father God, we ask on this day that you would use us in good and beautiful ways and that we would give ourselves freedom to pursue beauty, to create beautiful spaces, and to invite other people into those spaces. We ask all that in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thanks for joining us today as we strive to think carefully about our faith. You can help keep this ministry on the air by making a donation at leverington.org. For now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. We'll see you next time.